All right, and then we are up for the last paper presentation of TEI 15, which will be presented by uh, Ilke Fulmer from University of Nevada. And he will be presenting immersive simulation of visual impairments using a wearable see-through display. Thank you. Uh, thanks for pronouncing my name correctly. That doesn't happen a lot. Uh, so I'm here um, to present the work I did with my master's students, uh, Shara and uh, Alexander, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, over the next decade, the number of people with visual impairments is uh, going to significantly increase, not only due to the uh, aging uh, baby boomer generation, but also largely due to the obesity epidemic. Uh, as various studies show that uh, obese individuals are twice as likely to lose their vision due to cataracts or diabetic uh, retinopathy. Unfortunately, uh, our society is not very well uh, prepared to accommodate users with visual impairments. And uh, let me give you one specific example. Uh, currently, uh, falls are one of the leading uh, causes of death to due to injury among the elderly. And uh, various studies have found out that uh, users or elderly with visual impairments are twice as likely uh, to fall. And that's because they have a much harder time to detect uh, edges, such as curbs or steps. And um, it's estimated that approximately 1,000 uh, elderly with visual impairments a year die because of falls. Uh, very, uh, one simple way to uh, avoid uh, elderly falling is, for example, using like bright tape and marking edges so it's easier for them to see, um, see the edges. Um, so it's, it's kind of a good thing to kind of like do real-world accessibility inspections, and there's various tools available, like questionnaires or user studies. But it's been kind of argued that uh, simulation of visual impairments is a really good tool because it kind of gives you really a good first-hand experience of how a visually impaired person sees the world. And there are various tools available currently. Uh, for example, there are the old-school um, simulation goggles where you have a bunch of lenses and a frame and a couple of funnels, and then you kind of compose them together, and you can simulate a number of visual impairments. And this is like a low-cost solution, uh, but it's rather limited. You can only simulate the most common um, visual impairments. Uh, it's also kind of hard to, you know, if you quickly want to cycle as a designer, you want to cycle through the different types of visual impairments, you know, you have to disassemble the goggles. So that's not really very usable. But it is good because it, it does kind of like, you know, cover your field of view so you, you get a really good experience and you can do real-world accessibility inspections. So the second category is like uh, software simulators. There's various simulators available. I don't know if you ever tried the, the No Coffee Chrome plugin. So basically superimposes different type of visual impairments over any type of web page. Uh, it offers a flexibility because you can quickly cycle through different visual impairments. You have all sorts of sliders to adjust the intensity. So software simulators have the, the flexibility of quickly um, doing, doing quick accessibility inspections. But the limitation is that they're kind of like, you know, they're tied to a desktop, so you can only do like, um, you know, look at websites or images. It doesn't really, it's not very suitable for like real world um, accessibility inspections. And they also don't really model where the user is looking at. It kind of assumes the user is like looking at the center of the screen and then models the simulations based on that. But that's not really how a visual impairment works because if I look at the top of the screen, the, the, you know, my, what I see should change. So the third category of simulation tools are, uh, is various uh, virtual reality simulation tools, and they do a much better job at accurately modeling what the user is looking at. So they do head tracking and even individual eye tracking, so you can do very realistic um, visual impairment simulation. Uh, you can also do stereoscopy, like depth perception. But the limitation of virtual reality tools is that they're quite expensive. They're kind of like tied to a cave or expensive uh, 3D environments, and they're also limited to virtual environments. So you can't really, you know, take this and go into someone's house and, you know, see how their house looks like using a visual impairment. Um, so kind of summarizing, those are like, uh, you know, the three different uh, categories of uh, tools. So goggles are low cost, good for real-world inspections, but they don't have the flexibility. Software simulators have the flexibility, but they don't aren't very accurate, can't be used for real-world uh, 
accessibility inspections and then virtual reality tools uh, are accurate, but they have a high cost and uh, can't be used for real-world inspection. So we set out to come up with a new tool we call SimVis, basically kind of an amalgamation of the three different techniques, kind of like taking all the benefits of the techniques and having no, uh, none of the disadvantages. So how does it work? So we created uh, what we call kind of like a wearable see-through display. And center to our um, solution is the use of, uh, of uh, a head-mounted display. Like head-mounted displays become incredibly popular with things like Oculus Rift. So they become low cost. It's a wearable display, very immersive, large field of view. And then what we do is basically mount a camera in front of the HMD and basically you know, get the camera feed, feed it back into the HMD. So you can basically see the real world through uh, a head-mounted display. And then we apply different types of filters on top of, um, of the camera feed so we can simulate uh, different types of visual impairments. So um, we built our solution using the popular Oculus Rift. I don't know if you ever had a chance to try it. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, it has a high, uh, relatively high resolution, 640 by 800 per eye, 110 degree field of view. So it's very immersive, basically covers your entire field of view and a high refresh rate. It was kind of uh, challenging to kind of find a, a set of cameras that can match the field of view of the Oculus Rift because it's like 110. But we found a solution, actually, we use a PlayStation 4 camera as a dual sensor uh, setup with two HD uh, cameras and the the field of view of these cameras actually, if you combine them, matches the, the field of view of the Oculus Rift and it also has the same refresh rate. The only hard thing was that Sony had their own proprietary connector, so we had to kind of cut it up and reverse engineer and kind of turn it into a USB 3 connection, what it actually uh, is. To make this work, uh, we use VR Player, an open source uh, renderer that can do the barrel distortion uh, rendering required for the Oculus Rift, and then uh, VR player has support for uh, high level shader language uh, filters. So we basically implement the different filters using uh, DirectX. So this is how it looks like. So we basically just glued the camera on top of the Oculus Rift. Um, it doesn't come with a free beard, you have to grow that yourself. Um, uh, and the solution is kind of semi portable. You can just hook it up to a laptop. The only thing, if you want to do real world accessibility inspection, you do have to kind of uh, be close to a, a, a power socket because the Oculus Rift requires power. Um, so for the filter implementations, we, uh, it's very difficult to, to exactly model someone's specific visual impairment because it's often subject to large amounts of individual uh, variation. So what we did is basically look at the, the National Eye Institute, kind of provides these sample charts for each type of visual impairment. And then we made the intensity of the impairment kind of adjustable. So we, we modified the blur. You can basically, using shortcuts, uh, you can model, you can adjust the intensity. Um, so we implemented these most common uh, visual impairments. We also, in addition, uh, I'm also interested in colorblindness. A lot of people have uh, something like 5% of the male population is colorblind. And it's also leading to all sorts of like accessibility problems, like not being able to play Bejeweled and stuff like that. Um, so I'm showing you a real quick movie of three different types of visual impairments and then um, three different types of color blindness and then uh, visual impairments. So um, oh. deuteranopia, protonopia, and tritonopia, those are the three common color blindness. And then cataracts so is blur vision, uh, macular degeneration, so central, and then glaucoma as a peripheral vision is, uh, is modified. Now, in order to evaluate this approach, we did a very simple kind of like an A-B study uh, between our approach and Vision Sim, which is a commercial available uh, simulation tool, software simulation tool. We had a number of computer science students uh, try out both solutions, kind of randomize, and uh, had them do a number of like kind of like accessibility inspection tasks, so look at like an Ishihara chart, and look at like uh, a screen with, with, uh, with text. And then we had basically collected qualitative information using uh, Likert scales. And uh, with regard to immersion, the subjects found uh, SimVis to be more immersive. Ease of use, they found Vision Sim a little bit more easy to use. The difference was not significant. But for the ability to detect accessibility problems, they found uh, SimVis uh, preferable. Some of the current limitations, uh, again, like I said before, the simulations are kind of approximations. It's very difficult to exactly model someone's um, impairment, but by being able to kind of like 
adjust the intensity, you do give designers a good idea uh, of the range of, of visual impairments. The current resolution of the, uh, the DK1 that we used is not high enough that you can actually like read text on a smartphone, but fortunately uh, 2K and even 4K uh, head mounted displays uh, have been introduced and we're looking currently at uh, DK2, the development kit 2. Um, portability, our solution, uh, you do kind of like your tether two cables is not that uh, desirable. We also don't do eye tracking. That would be really cool if you could do that. So we're looking at that uh, currently uh, with the new uh, the DK2 kit. There are several companies that offer eye tracking. Uh, another thing that I would like to do is do, to do like uh, dynamic visual impairments. The, the visual impairments we currently have are like static, but there's also like various types of dynamic impairments, things like floaters and stuff like that. Um, I developed uh, an Android version of our simulation tool using the Google Cardboard. It's a low-cost low version of a head-mounted display that can turn any smartphone into a head-mounted display. Uh, so I have simulations available on that, but the problem is I don't have stereoscopy because most of the smartphones only have a single camera. Um, so that's it. Any questions? <coughs> Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Hi, Daniel Ashbrook from the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, I'm curious if you had any effects from um, what I'm assuming is that the PlayStation 4 camera does not mimic the interpupillary distance of the human eye or the field of view of the human eye, and I'm wondering. That's, yeah, that's that correct. So that's something we had to kind of work around, and you know, because every every one of those cameras gives you a stream of thousands. Uh, I forgot what the resolution is, but we had to modify it, and indeed, it's not the exact interpupillary distance, but it's a uh, yeah, we, we kind of subsample a little bit and try to, you know, take one part of, this, of, the, of the field of view. But that's something we should, uh, we should work on. And, and, um, for, the, for, the high res for the high definition uh, headsets, we do need to use different cameras that are, have a much higher resolution. And then we can probably uh, approximate the distance. But yeah, that's, this is the closest solutions that we, 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 could, we could figure out. Um, there are some uh, existing um, video see-through headsets in the uh, augmented reality community you might want to look into. I think yeah. that Vuzix makes some. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll take, check them out. Thank you. All right. Then maybe I can ask a question. Because sure. I was wondering, you, t you did your tests now with a smartphone application, which is kind of a small um, uh, yeah, thing to look at. Yeah, we, we, uh, yeah, we had it on a regular smartphone. This is, so this is a little bit like a kind of also a see-through uh, approach with different filters applied. It's not like the traditional software simulator that's like tied to a desktop. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Yeah. So I was wondering, because um, if you um, design something that is more, uh, makes more use of the space, so you have a, uh, yeah, a little, little bit larger, maybe gestures or something, like that, a little bit larger interaction space, then uh, could this also be used or do you then need the eye tracking? Um, eye tracking would be good. I don't know. Um, Eye tracking would be more accurate, but I, I, in one way, the lenses are so close to your to your eyes already that even I don't know. I I, I couldn't really figure out if eye tracking would actually be better. Uh. But I've seen the, the virtual reality solutions they use they do use eye tracking. But uh, I think just you know what you're saying in a larger space. So we had students basically hold a smartphone and then you know inspect the world, and it's kind of hard. But if you actually have it on your face and it's you know it's, it's really it covers your entire field of view, that you know I I feel that's a, a better a better approach and you know gives yeah. you better and also it's like hands free you don't have to hold the phone in your hand yeah. so um. all right because i was wondering and maybe this is a little bit further in the future but obviously people with visual disimpairments uh, it's not just the fact that they have visual dis disimpairments but also they perceive the world much more through the other senses so yeah. could you Elaborate yeah, that's kind of interesting, and uh, I think that's like an interesting uh, direction to move. And I've also heard about like there's also a hearing impairment simulator. So I can imagine that you know you have a whole set of different types of uh, you know kind of a sensory deprivation kind of approach. So um, yeah, I, I think that could be interesting, uh, interesting to explore. Another thing um, I didn't mention it, but it, it also has benefit. I, I know there's a Canadian company that does stuff with some sort of immersive uh, see-through display where they can specifically for people with vision impairments where they can basically like zoom in on something and then have it like close by and they can freeze frame and stuff like that. So that's kind of an, uh, yeah, an, an interesting other type of application for HMDs for specifically for people with vision impairments. All right. Any more questions? No, then I would like to thank Ilka and also all the other speakers of this session.